Thank you, Aaron and Rachel. I uh, never heard that song before, but how fitting with where we are going today uh, with our message as we will be in Genesis 2. And so you can go ahead and turn in your copy of God's Word to Genesis 2 as I express my gratitude and thanks to Alan allowing me to fill, fill the pulpit this morning as he and Tracy are out on vacation, uh, hopefully enjoying a little R&R, &R, getting a little uh, rest as he'll be back in the office this week. And uh, more importantly for you, he'll be back in the pulpit next Sunday as we continue through Isaiah. Day, uh, marching toward Easter Sunday. And so it is my privilege to be here this morning and to share from God's Word. And this morning, I want us to focus our attention on the subject of marriage. Over the course of the past six months or so, I've had the opportunity to sit with uh, teenagers all the way to senior adults and talk about the, the subject of marriage and how marriage is under attack. Just in the last couple of weeks, uh, I've had multiple people um, that I've just in the course of life had conversations with that are God-fearers that are walking away from their marriages. And so I want us this morning to refocus, recalibrate, and look at what God's Word has to say about marriage because I believe it is a foundational tenet of our society. So go marriages, so goes society. And so just because you are a believer does not mean you are going to have a successful marriage, doesn't mean you are even going to have a good marriage. You and I must constantly work on our marriages. And we must understand from a biblical perspective what God expects, anticipates, and desires for us, his children, as it necessitates in the marriage relationship. So, are we aware of what God's word teaches on marriage? I've entitled this morning's sermon from Genesis 2, 18 to 25, Marriage, More Than Roommates. And before we read our text, I want to ask those of you who are married a question. Are you and your spouse just roommates? Are you and your spouse merely roommates? Do you merely reside in the same residence? And though I don't want you to verbally respond to me, I do want you to contemplate that question. I'm going to ask us all several questions this morning to help hopefully land the sermon on our own hearts and minds and relationships. Because I think that we oftentimes assume the best when it pertains to us. And we sadly oftentimes assume the worst in others. And so, friends, I pray that we would, by the Holy Spirit, seek what the Lord would have from us. And so, before we get to God's Word, I wonder, what is shaping your vision of marriage? Unless you've been living under a rock, you understand that marriage, in the last decade or so, has become more and more anti what God's Word has established here in our own nation. And so this morning, we're not going to solve all the political problems in our nation. I am definitely not smart enough for that. That is not my purpose and my intent this morning. My intent is for us to not to look to Congress or to look to the Supreme Court or to listen to country music or to watch a movie, to uh, subscribe to Netflix or the Disney Channel, to discover what marriage is all about, but instead for us to look to God's Word. Because I believe all the factors in our life influence our, you and me in this room and online this morning, influence what we believe and think about marriage. And I want to put forth just as the, the sum of what this morning's message is going to be about is that we as Christians must hold God's word above every other influence in our lives. And sadly, we listen more to podcasts and to music and to other things than we do reading, absorbing, and applying the Word of God in our lives and in our relationships. 
And so this morning, I pray that God's word would penetrate our hearts, our minds, and our hands. And so let us read from Genesis 2 and see what the Lord has for us this morning. So Genesis 2, verses 18 through the end of the chapter, we find these words. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground, the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, he took one of his ribs and he closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman, and he brought her to the man. Then the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. And I want us this morning, as we look at this passage, I want us to see five biblically grounded truths concerning marriage. And so I'm just going to highlight these real quickly, then we're going to break them down individually. But the first thing I want us to see is that God is the creator of marriage. Secondly, God says it is not good for man to be alone. Third of all, God makes a woman for a man. Fourth, God says in marriage, one man plus one woman equals one flesh. And fifth, God desires there to be no shame between husband and wife. So let us jump in. Truth number one is that God is the creator of marriage. We actually see this in Genesis 1 and 2. We just now read the end of Genesis 2. But remember that Genesis 1 and 2 are telling the same story, right? Genesis 1 is a 30,000 Google map zoomed out vision of what happens on the, on the 6. And, and we'll go ahead and put the first couple of verses of chapter 2. Seven days of creation, right? Uh, a flyover of what happens. Then in Genesis 2, we, we zoom in to a three-foot street level person in the yard waving at us view of what happens specifically on day 6 of creation. And so these are not um, conflicting views. They're not conflicting um, um, episodes. They are harmonious, right? They're telling us the same story from different perspectives for different reasons. And so we see ultimately that God is the creator of marriage. Genesis 1 verses 24 to 31 specifically gives us the flyover of day six. And a few specifics from Genesis 1 that are germane to marriage are these, okay? Number one, man and woman are created in the image of God, verses 26 and 27 of chapter 1, right? We know this, but we cannot leave this. We need to to dwell on this often in our day and age. Man and woman are both created in the image of God. Number two, mankind is given dominion by the creator over all animals, verse 26. In verse 27, the creator establishes two genders, Two genders are established by our creator, male and female, verse 27. The fourth thing we see is the creator tells his creation, man and woman, to have children, verse 28. Moses goes on to repeat this imperative throughout Genesis. In Genesis 9, we see this. In Genesis 28, we see this. In Genesis 35, verse 11, we see it. In Genesis 48, we see it. Moses is clear that we are to fill the earth with our offspring. We as Christians need to be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth at the end of chapter 1 is juxtaposed to the beginning of chapter 1. What do we see at the beginning of chapter 1 in the creation narrative, right? We see that, let's go to it, look at it and see that we see that it is void, right? That there is nothing happening. It was without form, it is void, it is empty. 
When we close that chapter, God is saying, be fruitful and multiply, right? He has created in the expanses. He has created with a purpose. And we're going to see throughout our time this morning that God is an intentional God. He does not happenstance. He does not fly by the seat of his pants. He is an intentional, sovereign God. He was, is, and will always be that. Also, we see genealogies in chapter 5, post-sin, right? After the, after the garden, after fall, we see whispers and we see hints of every genealogy whispering the, the reality that we are to be fruitful, to multiply, to fill the earth, right? As image bearers of God, God wants to see tons and tons of image bearers, right? To worship him. We are responsible to fulfill that as his children, God has specifically and intentionally created the world we currently inhabit. Now, I don't want you and I to get lost in the weeds of the young, young earth or old earth debates. There's time and places for those things. But I do want you and I to understand that Genesis 1 and 2 are the foundation upon which the rest of the biblical text is built upon. Therefore, if we question or reject what Moses has written and the Holy, Spirit ha the Holy Spirit has preserved, we will have no ground upon which to stand. The arguments are fierce in our day. And our hope, our source is our faith, the book by which we live. And we anchor our, our hope, we anchor our arguments, we anchor our relationships in God's word. God's word says it and that settles it. The moment you and I inject a timid or an arrogant but, it's when drift becomes reality. Remember, you just have to turn the page and see that there's another individual that asks the question, but. Did God really say? Friends, are you and I and our friends and our families, are we not playing that same game in so many spectrums today? It broke my heart over the last week as I'd prepared this message to see just the onslaught on social media of what proclaiming evangelicals are saying about relationships, saying about what God's word is clear about. Friends, might you and I always anchor our opinions, our emotions, our hope, our future in the word of God? Do you know what the word of God says? Don't take my opinion of it. Don't take Alan's opinion of it. Read for yourself. Praise be to God that we have multiple Bibles in our dialect at a finger's tips away. Most of us have it on our phone in our pocket and can read it in any moment. Do you read God's word and do you cling to it as your source, as your refuge, as your fountain of life? In our day, authority is suspect. I pray we recognize God as our ultimate authority. If we don't see God in his word as our ultimate authority, we will have no ground to stand. This leads me to ask the following question. Is your view of marriage distorted because your understanding of biblical authority is compromised? Have you compromised where your authority lies? So goes your view of scripture, so goes your marriage. Truth number one is God is the creator of marriage. If he makes it, then guess what? He gets to set the rules and expectations. We see this in Isaiah. Alan preached on this text a few weeks ago from 29, 16. We see it in Jeremiah 18. We see it in Romans 9 where God is the potter, right? He is the potter and what are we? We're not another potter. We are the clay. He makes us to do his bidding, to be his creation, to be what he has designed us to be. And so friends, if he has created it, he sets the rules, the standards, the expectations. So truth number two is that God says it is not good for man to be alone, verse 18, right? Then the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. 
Moses, who we believe under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, wrote the first five books of the Bible, he doesn't utilize the words not good by accident in verse 18 of chapter 2. You see, when, when we come upon verse 18, it comes after chapter 1. And what do we remember in chapter 1, right? We remember that almost rhythm, rhythmic, right? It's good. It's good. It's good. It's good. It's very good. Then when we come into chapter 2, when we read those words, not good, that should startle us, right? We shouldn't just be like, oh, yeah, of course. Like, I've read that a million times. Like, yeah, that's what it says. No, it should jolt us about, wait, I thought everything was good. Why? Not good? It's intentional, right? God is intentional in what he does. And we see that specifically here, that this should startle us to understand that Moses is trying to get our attention and formulize our understanding of marital relationships. So what is it that is not good? Well, pretty simple. Man, being by himself is not good. Today, we think mostly in terms of psychological instead of physical. Remember, we saw in chapter 1 that God desires for man and woman to be fruitful and multiply. It's not just difficult. It is impossible for man alone to reproduce. Old Testament scholar Kenneth Matthews accurately points out isolation is not the divine norm for human beings. Community is a creation of God. Can I just take an aside right here and point out this is why so many people are struggling at so many different psychological and mental and physical realities today. We're living a year. It was a year ago, basically, that I preached from this pulpit the first sermon that was broadcast online because we were shut down due to COVID. Friends, do you understand? Friends online, do you understand that when we isolate ourselves we are headed down a path of destruction. We need other people. I need other people, not because I'm an extrovert and I enjoy being around other people. Introverts, extroverts, tall, small, whatever, boy, girl, we need people. We need people to laugh with us. We need people to cry with us. We need people to ask about us. We need to ask about other people. We need to not be so introspective that we're just always dwelling on us. Have you been around those people that don't engage with other people? They're miserable. They're miserable to be around. That person that's, that's shut up in a, in a place somewhere and they're always just downtrodden and you, and you know going like uh, you dread visiting them because they're so just negative. Friends, might that not be true of us? Might we understand the need for community? the need to, to reach out and to involve ourselves in other people's lives and to allow them to involve themselves in our lives. We need it. We see that it's foundational to God's creating purposes, right? He didn't create for isolation. He created with community in mind. That's why the fill and subdue command is there. Right? It's not just a, a one-off um, monastic type of lifestyle that he's created, but he created a community. And we see that uh, from the beginning of Scripture all the way through to the close of Scripture. Marriage is the means through which reproduction is to take place. As Christians, we have lost sight of the importance and significance of our fundamental roles and responsibilities as men and women. My humble assessment is because we, proclaiming Christians, are more educated by worldly means than we are by biblical means. I'm uh, in the process of reading a book by, by Carl Truman, um, and it's way heady. It's over my head. But he's walking through history and, and, and pointing out how the, the concept and the, the, just the basic forms of, of life have changed over the last hundreds and about 500 years, really, just walking through and where we are today. It's a, it's a much different day today than it was 10 years ago, than it was 30 years ago, than it was 75 years ago. And we need to understand that we're, we're caught up in that. It's not just those people out there, right? It's us. Our, our way of thinking, 
our, our, our sense of reality, our sense of hope, our sense of promise, all those things have been twisted and, and convoluted. And we need to get back to what God's word says with God's people and understand that we are to be set apart. We are to be different. So, question, what does God's word say is the main role and responsibility of men and women? I've been uh, participating in the men's study on Thursday night and uh, several men in our church uh, have been discussing this. What's the role of men? right? What, what does that look like? What does it look like to be a godly man? Is that simply just what my dad looked like? Is that some war hero? What, do, what does it look like, right? And so we've batted around lots of different things, but the goal of those times on Thursday night thus far has been to look at God's word and to see what does God's word state that a man is? I believe, and this is outside the scope of my time this morning, I believe that God's word clearly lays out there are different roles and distinctions for men and women. And we need to understand those because those are different from what culture and society are telling us, from what textbooks your kids are reading in school are telling them. And so we need to understand the fight is on our doorstep. Are we fighting for the life the Lord has created and given us to live. Truth number three, God makes a woman for a man. Look at uh, verses 18 to 23 there. God solves the problem which he has presented in verse 18 at the end of verse 18, right? He says it's not good that man should be alone. What does he say? He says, you know, Adam, just go make you a helper suited for you. No, he says, I, God, will make him a helper fit for him. He then allows us today to see the process unfold in verses 18 to 23. But we need to remember that God is not a reactionary God. God is a sovereign creating deity. Meaning the problem in verse 18 wasn't a problem for God, nor was sin in chapter 3 a problem. God, before speaking the cosmos into existence in Genesis 1, knew your name. Just as he knew and purposed Eve to listen to the serpent in Genesis 3. Furthermore, he intentionally and purposefully created man and woman in the way he did for orthodoxy and orthopraxy. Our understanding of creation guides our heads and our hands. Both our beliefs and our practices are important. And so God is intentional in what he's doing. He's not caught off guard. He's not surprised when we read the things that we read, like it's not good for man to be alone. When we read the sin in chapter three, those are not things that God's like, oh, I didn't envision that happening. God is God. He is not like you and me, okay? And we need to understand that because he is sovereign over it all. God declares what for this woman? He declares that she is to be a helper fit for him. The term means help in the sense of an aid and support, and is used for the Lord's aiding his people in the face of enemies in Psalms 121 and 124. Moses also uses this term to refer to God's help in deliverance from Pharaoh in Exodus 18.4. In the case of the biblical model, the helper is an indispensable partner required to achieve the divine commission. Adam is formed and the woman is is built. We see in Genesis 2, 7 that God created Adam from the dirt. Then we see down here in verse 21, we see God building Eve from what? From Adam, right? Once God, uh, once again, God could have given an animal to Adam, right? We see the clear that, we, we clearly see that in verses 19 and 20, right? When he needs a helper, what does God do? He says, all right, Adam, look at all these animals. They're going to all parade before you. And he names them, right? And what does this text say? The text says there's not a helper that's suitable for him out of all the animals, right? Once again, God isn't surprised by this. It's not like, oh, well, I thought he would have really liked one of those animals. No, God has been intentional. He's forming a foundation for our understanding of human relationships. And so he, all these animals prayed before him and none of them are suitable for Adam. Then what does God do? God, God puts him to sleep, right? 
And out, out, as he's asleep, God takes out from his side, out from his rib, uh, his genetic materials and fashions a woman who is in fact suitable for Adam. I also think it's important that here in verse 23, Adam names woman according to her nature as woman. Then we see over in Genesis 3.20 by her personal name, Eve. Eve, or woman, does not name Adam. Just like Adam names all the animals, he names the woman. It's also interesting to think that God is a engaging God, right? From the beginning of scripture, God communicates with his people. And we decide, well, that is mind boggling. That the God of all creation, would, would humble himself enough to communicate with measly old people like you and me. He communicates with Adam. We know he's communicating with us today through his living word that we have. But we also see that Adam mirrors his creator, right? The first words we have are after God brings Eve to Adam. That's the first time he speaks that the, the scriptures, I don't think he was mute until that point, uh, but that's the first recorded words we have is when the woman comes to him, he responds and, he, and, he, and he's poetic and he, and he says, at last, right? Not Edda James at last, but this at last, right? This, and it's, it's exclamatory and indicating that, that he's excited, right? Like you just think about it, all these animals have passed by and then he sees his equal, right? He sees uh, his, his helpmate come by and he's like, yes, this is what I'm talking about, God, right? And so we must understand this because we just like, well, yeah, of course it says that. No, this is, once again, it's foundational to our understanding of relationships. So the question, is there in important significance to the created order. Do you know why God created the way he did? And not so much do you know why, because right, you're not God, you can't do all those things, but do you understand? Do you understand what the Bible lays out and what the implications are of that understanding that he has clearly articulated in his word? Truth number four, God says in marriage, the two become one. The two become one. Verse 24. Notice in verse 24, God has you and me in mind in the instructions for marriage. Adam doesn't have a dad or a mom, right? He doesn't have a dad or a mom, but it says, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. You and I exist because of a man and a woman. Now that man and that woman, they may have embodied everything Genesis 1 and 2 describes. But more likely, they failed more often than they succeeded. Notice that God instructs the man to leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife. I believe God in his word, pre-fall, Genesis 1 and 2, and post-fall, Genesis 3 and following, instructs men to lead in the pursuit of their spouse. This begins in courtship or chasing after a worthy helpmate. This continues in the marital union. We see this, uh, just a couple of examples. We see this first by leaving your parents in Genesis 2, 24. We see it second that a man is to lead in Ephesians 5.25 when Paul describes the man is to love his wife like Christ loved the church. Right? Christ pursues us. Men, we are to pursue a helpmate. And then once she becomes our wife, we are to continue to pursue her. We don't stop once she's gotten the ring and she said, I do, when we threw the big party and celebrated and danced our first dance, we continue to pursue. And I think this is what Peter's getting at in 1 Peter 3, 7, when he says that we are to live with our brides in an understanding way. I think we need to be the uh, aggressor in that situation. We are to pursue. If our marital relationship is not right, Men, I believe it is up to us to pursue our bride. 
We are to pursue them. Parents, are you raising your children with understanding that they need to leave and cleave? Are you raising your parents to understand, are you raising your children to understand that? Boys, do you understand that it is your responsibility to leave and cleave? Men, we are called to hold fast to our wives. Once again, I believe the Lord puts the burden and responsibility on the health and wealth and the viability of the marriage relationship on the man. You see, Moses elsewhere used these words, hold fast. I love the song we sang talking about how God will hold us fast. But Moses in Deuteronomy 10, 20 and in Deuteronomy 13, 4, he says that we are to hold fast unto the Lord. And so I would encourage you to look those verses up and to, to memorize those as your standard, men, as to how you are going to love your spouse. I tell as many people as I can that marriage is phenomenal. Saying yes to Christ's salvific call in my life is number one. However, the best decision I have made in my own free choosing was when I asked Stephanie Elaine Hood, Stephanie Elaine Hayes, on December 23rd of 2004, if she had married me. Marriage has had many ups and downs. And with children, there are lots of ups and downs. And I'm a prideful, arrogant, ignorant individual. And it is incumbent upon me to remember Ephesians 5.25. When I contemplate the fact that I'm to love her like Christ loved the church, it changes everything. It changes everything in our relationship. And I need to be reminded of that because I am quick to point out like her sin. But you know, what's been a refining thing for me in the means of, of marriage has been that God has revealed more of my sinfulness in my marital relationship. As I look at my wife and as I see, you know, just the one or two times a day that she sins, um, when I see those things, instead of being, ah, did you see that? God, by his grace and his mercy, reminds me that such as I, I am way more wicked, depraved, and sinful than Steph's ever thought about being. And so instead of pointing out her sin, God uses that as a means to remind me to look in the mirror and say, oh yeah, I've got a lot I need to work on. And so do you see the sin in your own life? Do you understand that? And so we're quickly running out of time, um, but I just want to uh, make a couple more points. Um, I want to point out that this verse is more than sex, but it's certainly not less than that. And I want to say from this pulpit that we as Christians, we must reclaim sex for the biblical standard that has been given to us. We cannot let the world, the porn industry, all the depraved uses of what God has given, we cannot let that mess up what God has specifically and intentionally created. And so friends, might I encourage you to teach your children, to teach your friends, to teach your families from God's word, a, a biblical understanding of sex. Sex is a beautiful God-given gift used within his rules and restraints. We must understand that. We must teach that. We should not be too embarrassed to say, I don't know if I'm gonna say it right. And I, we've got to engage in that. And trust me, that's becoming full well known to me as I'm raising two little guys up that I'm gonna to have to begin more and more intentionally talking about some of these difficult issues. But we've got to, we've got to press into that. So what is our biblical understanding of sex, right? Because if we don't understand from a biblical perspective, we will be on our heels in this day and age where sex sells and it is everywhere from billboards to magazines to TV shows, it is everywhere. Do you understand what God's word has to say about sex? Our last point is this, God desires there to be no shame between husband and wife. And so just real quickly here, we see, and the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. 
Friends, can I just encourage you to know that that if you thought it was weird that we talked about sex and now we're talking about being naked, um, that is a little bit weird and awkward. But I want you to understand as husband and wife, I do want you to be naked with each other, but I want to, to drill in a little bit deeper than that. And I want you to understand that there was no shame, there was no, there was no guilt, there was no sin. And I, I believe that Moses is setting up for chapter three here, but specifically for us today, I think we can take this away from this passage to understand that there should be no guilt and shame between you and your spouse. What are you holding on to that you don't want to reveal to them? Would you, would you humble yourself and say, I've been, I've been hanging on to this sin, I've been hanging on to this issue, and I just wanna lay it down before the Lord and before you and just confess these things. I pray that you are not just a roommate with your spouse, but that you enjoy all that God has created in the marital relationship. And that takes work. It's difficult. It's hard. We struggle with it. But by God's grace, he is able and capable. Because the last question I have for you there is this. Do you believe that marriage is for your happiness or for your holiness? Gary Thomas writes a book um, called Sacred Marriage. And the, the thesis of that book is that marriage is for our holiness, not for our happiness. I believe that most of us engaged in a marital relationship because we wanted, we were selfish. We wanted what we wanted. Many today are looking for marriage because they want to be happy. Friends, can I say, I believe that God's design for marriage is for our holiness. I've been meditating on the book of 1 Peter the last week. And I, I just keep going back in there where it's, he just says, I, his desire for us is to be holy. Holy. Marriage is a means for us to be holy. God has created it intentionally. And I pray that you understand that. And so my last question for you is this. How would you rate your marriage on a scale of one to 10? How would you rate your marriage? I'm gonna pray for us here in just a minute and Aaron's gonna come. He's gonna sing a song over us and, and we're gonna stand and respond. And, and I just wanna encourage you this morning, maybe you and your spouse need to just pray together. Maybe you need to contemplate, where is my marital relationship? Where am I on that scale of one to 10? Where do I desire to be? Let me pray for us. God, we thank you for the blessing of marriage. Might we as your children look to you via your word for instruction, understanding and help in our specific roles and responsibilities as men and women in marital union. I lift up those men and women who long to be married but for whatever reason, that prayer hasn't been answered. Would you comfort? I plead on behalf of the man and woman who is on the brink of walking away, that you would hold them fast unto their spouse. Oh Lord, would you sanctify each and every marriage that is represented in this room for your glory and the good of your people. Thank you, Father, for not giving up on your bride. Jesus, we are grateful for your example of pursuing your bride. Holy Spirit, we pray you land this sermon on the hearts, minds, and marriages as you see fit. Amen. Aaron's going to come and he's going he's gonna to sing. And I, always, you're welcome to join in and sing. But we want you to respond. And so as you stand, Aaron comes and sing. Would you respond to what God is calling and laying upon your heart? Would you do business with the Lord?